Today we are revising the Cambridge IGCSE Physics Paper 1, which is the multiple choice. This paper is from February, March 2023, and we are going to go over all the 40 questions. I'm going to provide as detailed explanations as possible. And before we get started, please remember to subscribe. Let's get to the work. The first question says a measuring cylinder contains water. The diagrams show the measuring cylinder before and after some of the water is poured into a beaker. The first diagram shows the level of the liquid and this is 100, 105, 110, 115. This is 115 cubic centimeters. The second diagram shows 50, 55, 60. This is 60 cubic centimeters. So, how much water has been poured into the beaker? All right. We started with 115. We are now at 60. The difference is which gives us 55. So our answer is C. Question number two shows the speed time graph for a car. Which row describes the motion of the car at point X and at point Y? In this diagram, we can see that at X, the gradient is constant and non-zero. Gradient is equivalent to acceleration in speed time graphs. So the gradient is positive, it's non-zero and it's constant. At Y, the gradient is zero, which means acceleration is zero. All right, let's use this information in our question. At point X, there is acceleration, so speed is increasing because the acceleration is positive. Speed is increasing, meaning A is not correct. This is not correct. B is not correct because at A, the speed is increasing and it's not constant. We are left with C and D to consider further. All right, at point Y, the speed is constant. There is no acceleration happening. Remember, acceleration is a change of speed or a change of velocity. So there is no, there is no change of speed which is happening. So constant speed, moving with constant speed. So between C and D, D is the correct one. Question number three says, a ball is dropped in a vacuum from a height of four meters above the surface of mass. The acceleration of the ball at a height of three meters is 3.8 meters per second squared. What is the acceleration of the ball at a height of one meter above the surface of mass? When we are in a vacuum, for any given environment or for any given gravitational field, the acceleration will be a constant. So this acceleration will be experienced at most heights which are close to the surface of mass. We can pretty much say all heights within uh, the vicinity of mass. So our answer is B. Two objects are placed on a balance on each side as shown. Which properties of the objects can be compared using the balance. Let's do an elimination here. A balance does not really measure volume, so this one is out. A balance does measure weight and mass, so B is looking good. 
C is not good because of volume there. D, well, that's not correct. Our answer is B here. A rectangular swimming pool is 50 meters long and 25 meters wide. It contains water at a depth of 2 meters. The density of the water is 1000 kg per cubic meter. What is the mass of the water in the pool? We should be familiar with the equation density is equal to mass over volume. Therefore, mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. Now, in this question, we are given the density. We need to calculate the volume first before we get the mass. Volume is equal to length times width times depth. This gives us 50 by 25 by 2. That will be 2,500. All right. So density, which is 1,000 here, multiplied by 2,500, we get D. Number six. An object is rising vertically at a constant speed through water. There are three vertical forces on it. The weight, the drag force, and the upward force. Which diagram shows the magnitude and direction of the vertical forces acting on the object? Let's use elimination. In A, we have the upward force, it's pointing up. The drag is pointing up. If this object is rising, then the drag must point downwards because drag is friction. Friction points in the direction which, oppose, which is opposite the direction of motion. So A is not correct. Let's consider B. We have the upward force and we have the drag. And when the drag is pointing upwards, drag must point downwards if the object is moving upwards. So the direction of motion of the object should be opposite the direction of drag. Another reason why B is not correct is this object is rising at constant speed. So the upward forces must be equal to the downward forces. There should be no acceleration. Constant speed means no acceleration. So here we see upward forces are equal to 5. Downward forces, we have 1. So there is a resultant of 4 newtons. This makes it impossible for the, for the ball to move at constant speed. So B is out. Now let's look at C. C, we have the upward force pointing upwards, the downward, the, the drag is pointing downwards, the weight, the weight should always point downwards eh, towards the center of the earth or the planet in question. So the arrows are pointing in the right directions, but there is a resultant force because we have four newtons down and two newtons up, giving us a resultant of two newtons down. This resultant means there should be acceleration and therefore we cannot achieve constant speed. Let's look at D. Output forces, three newtons, Output forces and weight. The arrows are pointing in the right directions. The magnitude of the forces which are pointing downwards is equal to the magnitude of the forces which are going up. There is zero resultant force, so we are going to experience constant speed. The answer is D. 
Number seven, which force produces heating during contact with a moving object? Well, the friction between the moving object and the surface which it is, which it is in contact with will lead to production of thermal energy. So our answer is B. A mineral is balanced at its midpoint. It remains balanced when a 3 newton load is hung from the 40 centimeter mark and the second load is hung from the 80 centimeter mark. Okay, let's draw the diagram of this setup. This is our meter room. This is the midpoint. The weight of the meter room will act at the midpoint, so we are not going to consider it because it is passing through the pivot at the center. So the moment due to the weight of the meter room is zero. Now we are left to consider the three newton load and the second load. Now our meter room, let's say it starts here at zero centimeters and it gets to 100 centimeters. All right. The 40 centimeter mark would be somewhere here. So 40 centimeter mark will be here. This is where the three newton load is. This distance is 10 centimeters from the pivot. The 80 centimeter mark would be somewhere here. So the second load whose weight, let's say, is x, would be acting here. The 80 centimeter mark is 30 centimeters from the pivot. This is the 50 centimeter mark. So 30 centimeters there. Okay. If the meter rule is balanced, it means the clockwise moments due to x are equal to the anti-clockwise moments due to the 3 newton force. So let's write an equation which shows that. 3 newtons multiplied by 10, that is the anti-clockwise moments, equal to 30 multiplied by x. This is the clockwise moments. X will be equal to 1. If you solve this equation, x will be equal to 1 newton. So our answer is A. Number 9 says, a student measures the length of a spring. She then attaches different weights to the spring. She measures the length of the spring for each weight. The table shows her results. What is the extension of the spring with a weight of 3 newtons attached to it? The extension is equal to the extended length minus the original length. In the case of the 3 newton weight, the extended length is 533. The original length is the length when nothing is attached to the, to the spring. So that's 520. This gives us extension equal to 13. D is our answer here. Number 10 says, which power station produces the greatest atmospheric pollution for each unit of energy generated? Okay. A gas-fired power station will produce some atmospheric pollution. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all those greenhouse gases. The hydroelectric power station we do not know of any gases which will be produced by this 
The nuclear power station, same thing. The wind farm, same thing. So the gas-fired power station is the culprit here. The 500 newton weight is raised through a height of 5 centimeters. How much work is done by the force? So when you raise this weight, you are giving gravitational potential energy to this weight. That gravitational potential energy is the work being done by the force. So work done here is equal to the gravitational potential energy given to the weight and that's equal to the mass of the well the mass the gravitational potential sorry, the gravitational acceleration multiplied by the change in height and v that's our weight so 500 that's mg multiplied by here we want to use SI units because our answer answers are given in SI units. So five centimeters uh, is equal to 0 0.05 meters. We have A as our answer. What is the unit of power? Well, you should know that it is the watt. For reference, the volt is the unit for potential difference or EMF. The neutron is the unit for force. Force. The jaw is the unit of energy. The diagram shows a rectangular block of weight 16 newtons. It is resting on a flat surface. What is the pressure at the base of the block due to its weight? We know that pressure is equal to force per unit area. In this case, the force is the weight. The force exerted on the ground by this block is the weight which is 16 newtons. The cross-sectional area is the area of the face which is sitting on the ground. That face is the opposite of this side. So the cross-sectional area of the face which is sitting on the ground is 4 centimeters multiplied by 5 centimeters giving us 20 centimeter squared. So we have 20 centimeter squared. This gives us 0 0.80 newtons per centimeter squared. Or answer C. Number 14. A piston traps a mass of gas inside a cylinder. Initially, the piston is halfway along the length of the cylinder. The piston is now moved towards the open end of the cylinder. The temperature of the gas remains constant. How are density and pressure of the gas affected by moving the piston? When we move the piston outwards like this, we are increasing the volume occupied by the gas. Now, we know that density of the gas is equal to the mass of the gas divided by volume. When we increased the volume, we did not change the mass of the gas. So, volume has gone up, but the mass remained constant meaning density is now less. Density is now less. Let's look at pressure. We know that 
the pressure of the gas is due to the particles of this gas hitting the walls of the container or the cylinder. Now, these particles have more space to move about. So they are not going to hit the walls of the container as frequently as they were doing when they were crammed in, one, in a small space. So now there is less pressure. Looking at that, density decreases and pressure decreases. Our answer would be A. Which statement describes what happens to the air particles when the air is heated? When you heat air, the particles, they move faster. So, A is out, B is looking good. The particles, they don't move closer, they actually move further apart if they have room to do so. The particles vibrate faster. This was going to be true if we were heating a solid. For air, it's not vibration anymore, but it's actual translational movement. Our answer would be B here. Number 16. What happens when the temperature of a liquid increases? Well, when you increase the temperature of the liquid, the mass of that liquid is not going to increase. Mass is the amount of matter in a substance. So the amount of matter is going to remain constant. A is out because of that. B, which says mass increases, is also out because of that. When we learn the kinetic theory of matter, we know that heating a substance leads to an increase in the volume of that substance, especially when it is allowed to do so. So volume increases, this is looking good, this is looking good. When volume increases, this is going to make the liquid less dense. Let's look at the reason why. Density is equal to mass over volume. Now, if this denominator grows, becomes bigger, and M remains constant, it means density will become a smaller number. So the liquid is going to become less dense. Number 17. In which states of matter can thermal energy be transferred by convection? Convection is a method which is used in fluids. And that means gases and liquids only. So B is our correct answer. A transverse wave moves along a rope. The diagram shows the position of the rope at one particular time. Which two labeled points are one wavelength apart? We typically define the wavelength as the distance between adjacent crests, like here and here, or adjacent troughs, like here and here. But that option is not given here, so we are going to define the wavelength as the distance between adjacent points which are in phase. Here, the two points which are in phase are X and Z. We consider them to be in phase because they are doing the same things at the same time. So our answer is C. The diagram shows a ray of light being reflected from a plane mirror. 
which row identifies the angles of incidence and reflection. Important point to note here is when we measure the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection, we measure them from the normal. This is our normal, this edge line, that's the normal. So the two points which are measured from the normal, the two angles which are measured from the normal are x and y. So our answer should be C, number 20. Blue light has a typical wavelength of 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters and frequency of 0 0.6 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Which row gives a typical wavelength and frequency for red light? All right, we need to start with the visible light spectrum, which red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. All right, the wavelength decreases as we go in that direction, but the frequency increases which means looking at the position of red and blue red must have a larger wavelength compared to blue light so let's look for we can see that here the wavelength is less than what is given for blue light here it's less again. So the reasonable values are 6.9, 6.9 times 10 to the minus 7. All right. Now let us consider the frequencies. The frequency of red light must be less than the frequency of blue light. So here we have 0 0.60 here we have 1.3 is bigger than this one but red light should have less frequency our answer would be c bigger wavelength smaller frequency number 21 which diagram shows what happens when a ray of white light passes through a prism let's use elimination a here is correctly showing that we have some refraction happening here. But it is not showing us dispersion which must happen. We must see different levels of refraction for the different colors of the visible spectrum. So A is not correct. B here, let me draw the normal. Light is moving from an optically less dense medium to an optically dense medium. This light must be refracted towards the normal, not away from the normal. We can see they indicated Dispersion here happening, different levels of refraction, but the direction of refraction is wrong. So B is not correct. With C, things were looking good until we got to this part. That light which is emerging from the prism is refracted in a wrong direction. So C is out. This is D is our correct answer. A TV station transmits a signal to a television receiving dish. The television has an on-off indicator light. The TV is switched on by a remote control which changes the indicator light from red to green. Which electromagnetic wave which electromagnetic wave used in these actions has the longest 
wavelength. All right. From TV to satellite, TV station to satellite, we are using microwaves. Remote control, controlling the TV, this is infrared waves. The red light and the green light, this is part of the visible spectrum. Now we know that, okay, we have radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultra, X-rays, gamma, like this. The wavelength increases in this direction. That means gamma rays have the smallest and radio waves have the largest or the longest wavelength. Now, between microwaves, which is A, and infrared, which is B, and visible, which is C and D, we can see microwaves have the longest. So our answer is A here. Number 23. A sound wave has a wavelength of 0 0.024 meters. What is the frequency of this sound wave and is it audible to humans? Okay. We know that the wave equation tells us V is equal to F lambda. Therefore, F is equal to V over lambda. The reasonable value for V is, let's say, 330 meters per second. If we substitute, we will have 330 divided by 0 0.024, and that's going to give us 18,750 hertz. Okay. So, the frequency, we are looking at C and D. 14,000 hertz is audible to humans. We know the audible range is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So C is our answer there. The diagram shows a bar magnet at rest on a smooth horizontal surface. A length of soft iron wire is held parallel to the magnet. The wire is released. What happens? Soft iron or iron in general is ferromagnetic. Is attracted to magnets. So when you give it a chance, it will be attracted to move towards the magnet. That makes B the correct phrase. A man walks across a carpet. He becomes negatively charged by friction with the carpet. What happens? as it touches a metal object connected to the earth. If the man is now negatively charged, it means he has an excess of electrons. So this man needs to lose those electrons. So B is our correct phrase. Number 26. A laboratory has a standard wire of non-resistance. It also has other wires made from the same material as the standard wire, but of different lengths and diameters. Which wire would definitely have a resistance of less than the standard wire? We know that the longer the wire, the more resistance it will put up to electrons or current flowing through it. 
So we would prefer shorter wires here. Short wires have less resistance compared to longer wires provided everything else is constant. How about diameter? We know that it is easier for electrons to move through a bigger diameter than to move through a smaller diameter. So the bigger the diameter, the less the resistance. So we want a short wire with a large diameter. That gives us C. Number 27. The diagram shows a circuit. Which energy transfers OK? We have the battery. Yes, we have the lamp. Get its energy there. Then that it is given to the surrounding air. Oh, that looks good. We have the battery. Yes. We have the surrounding air. The order. Another battery. That's not looking good. We have the lamp. I think we should start with the battery. We have the surrounding, so our answer is A. In the battery, we have conversion from chemical to electrical. In the lamp, we have conversion from electrical to heat and to light. And that heat is going to be transferred to the air which is surrounding this lamp. The light will also be dispersed into the air. The same process is going to happen with the resistor. Well, the similar process. The resistor is going to produce heat and that heat energy is going to be dissipated into the surrounding air. That's what makes A a good choice. Number 28 says, X, Y, and Z are lamps. In which lamps is there a current? Here, this lamp X is connected to the source of power via this transformer. But we have DC here. DC is not going to be passed on to the secondary. So X is not going to have current. Anything that says X is current is out. Okay, we are left with C and D. Okay, light energy comes here. Some of the current can pass through this resistor, the thermistor, and some of the current can come to the lamp. So why can you have current? Let's look at V. Okay, some of the current can pass through this LDR and some can branch to Z. So Y and Z, they can have current. Our answer would be number 29 says, the diagram shows a circuit. Which change causes the bulb in the circuit to become brighter? When you look at this circuit, this is the battery or a cell. This is the thermistor and this is the bulb. Now, for the bulb to be brighter, we need more current flowing through this circuit. So, we need to reduce the resistance of this thermistor. Now, what happens is when it's very hot, the thermistor's resistance decreases. When it is very cold, the thermistor's resistance increases. So let's increase temperature. 
Number 30. The current in a kettle is 10 amps. The kettle is protected by a 13 amp fuse. The owner of the kettle replaces the 13 amp fuse with a 3 amp fuse. What happens when the kettle is switched on? The current is going to pass through the fuse first before it gets to the kettle. And looking at these ratings, the current being drawn by the kettle is too much than the fuse can handle. So the fuse is going to burn. And the kettle is not going to be damaged. So the fuse melts and the kettle is not damaged. If we use a fuse which is too big, for example, we remove the 3 amp fuse and we put the 20 amp fuse. What's going to happen is the current will come through the fuse. The 20 amp will perhaps be able to handle that current. If it is, let's say, 15 amps, the fuse, this fuse will handle the 15 amps. But our kettle is not able to handle 15 amps. In that case, it is the kettle which will burn and the fuse will remain intact. But the job of the fuse is to protect the kettle. So you want to use fuses which are closer to the rating of the kettle. Number 31. A wire is moved down in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. Three changes are suggested. Which changes increase the EMF induced in the wire? Firstly, the reason why we are moving this wire in the magnetic field is so that we can cut the magnetic flux. You can just say cut the magnetic field lines. It's okay. Now, if you increase the speed of movement of the wire, it means you are increasing the rate of cutting of magnetic flux. That means you are going to get more EMF. The more you cut the magnetic flux, the more EMF you get. If the magnetic field strength is decreased, that is similar to reducing the magnetic field lines between the north and south pole there. So now when you cut those field lines, you are, you are cutting fewer of them. So the EMF is actually going to be less. If you change the direction of the magnetic field, you will change the polarity, that is the positive or negative of the EMF induced in the wire. You are by no means increasing the EMF. So that's not going to work again. So the suggested change that would make sense here is 1. Number 32. In an experiment, a wire is held above a compass needle as shown. An electric current is switched on in the wire and the compass needle is deflected. Which row explains why this happens and then describes what happens when the current is reversed. We know that the current carrying conductor is a magnetic field. If you have a conductor, let me draw my conductor here, and there is current in this conductor it means there will be a magnetic field which can be represented as concentric lines, like this. The direction of that field can be figured out using the right-hand grip rule. Go and figure out the right-hand grip rule. Now, the magnet here, this little compass, has been deflected because a current carrying conductor 
is a magnetic field. If you change the direction of that current, then you are going to see the needle of the magnet of the compass changing direction as well. So let's look at the options. Option C is the correct one. The magnetic field around a current carrying conductor and the deflection of the compass changes. Number 33. Over time, the strength of the magnets in an electric motor decreases, which Rod describes two ways to keep the motor running at its original speed. All right. If you want the motor to keep on running fast, you will have to increase the current so that we compensate for the decrease in the strength of the magnet. So A and B are out. We are looking at C and D now. The number of turns in the coil. If you are able to do anything about it, you would rather increase the number of turns on the coil to compensate for the decrease in strength of the magnet. Our answer would be D. Number 34. A rechargeable battery contains lithium. The lithium exists as positive lithium ions. How does an ion of lithium differ from an atom of lithium? All right. If we start with an atom, an atom is neutral. If you take away an electron from a neutral atom, you get a cation, which is a positively charged ion. So, positively charged ions, they have fewer electrons, minus electron there, they have fewer electrons. So, A is correct. Just for reference, if this neutral atom gains an electron, it becomes an anion. Let's say plus electron. And that anion will have more electrons. Number 35. An ion nuclide is represented by the symbol shown. Which statements about a nucleus of this ion nuclide are correct? Right. The nucleus contains 56 neutrons. Well, this is not correct because 56 is the number of neutrons and protons. So 56 minus 26, which is the number of protons, this will give us the number of neutrons. All right. The nuclear number is 30. Well, 56 is the nuclear number here. The proton number is 26. This one is correct. The number of protons is 26. For reference, nuclear number is the number of nucleons. Protons and neutrons found in the nucleus. All right, so the answer here is D. Number 36. What is an artificial source of background radiation? Well, A is correct. This is natural, this is natural, this is natural. So, number 37. A sample of radioactive isotope has an initial rate of emission of 128 counts per minute and a half-life of four days. How long will it take for the rate of emission to fall to 32 counts per minute? Let's see how this works. We start with 128. 
after one half life, which is four days in this case, the count rate drops to half. So we now have 64. After another half life, the count rate drops to half of 64. Now we are at 32. So we need four days for the count rate to drop to. We need four plus four, we need eight days for the count rate to drop to 32. Number 38. How long does it take for the moon to make one complete orbit of the Earth? We know it takes one month, approximately one month. For the sake of reference, 24 hours is the time it takes the Earth to rotate on its axis. One year is the time it takes the Earth to make a complete orbit around the Sun. Number 39. Sun is a mass given. Which element accounts for most of this mass? It is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the fuel which is powering the Sun. We see nuclear fusion happening. Hydrogen plus hydrogen giving us helium. This is the process for reaction which happens and it produces energy. That energy is the energy we get from the sun. Number 14. The nearest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri. At a distance of 4.2 light years, which statements are correct? Telescope images of Proxima Centauri show it as it was 4.2 years ago. This is true. Let me let me just explain why that is true. This is Proxima Centauri. This is our telescope here. For us to see, this is us and our telescope. For us to see this star, light from the star has to travel to us. How far is this planet? This star is 4.2 light years. So light takes 4.2 years. To reach our telescope or our eyes. So every time you look at Proxima Centauri, you are seeing light that has traveled for the past 4.2 years in order to reach you. So you are always seeing a delayed version of this star. Number two, the spacecraft near Proxima Centauri sends Read your message to the Earth. It would take 4.2 years to arrive. This is true again for almost the same reasons. The spacecraft, let's say it's here, sends a message. The distance between that spacecraft and us is almost 4.2 light years. So, read your waves, they travel at a speed that is exactly the same as light waves. So, it will take 4.2 years to reach us. Proxima Centauri is within the Milky Way galaxy. So, C is not correct. So, 3 is not correct. Our answer is B. Thank you very much, guys, for watching this video. Please subscribe to promote the work I'm doing. Bye-bye.